Hello, everyone. Today is July 8th, 2023, and welcome to this special session of the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. My name is Bob Flax, the CGS president, and in a moment, I'm going to turn this session over to Rebecca Shoot, our executive director. But first, I'd like to welcome any new members to the book club. So if you're joining us here for the first time, if you would just raise your hand, it will give you a chance to say hello. I'm not seeing any new names. Oh, I'm now seeing a new name. <laughs> so anyone who's here for the first time who just wants to say hello and introduce yourself? Okay, seeing no waving hands, I'll just proceed ahead. So over the past five months, we've been discussing the book Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century, along with the authors who are here with us again today. So given that the book contains numerous proposals and practical suggestions for how to move our current system of global governance more in the direction of a world federation, and given that CGS is now embarking on our next strategic planning cycle and exploring different options for the kinds of causes and campaigns that we'll be advocating for, we thought it would be ideal to bring those two things together, to both review the book while at the same time identifying which proposals in the book CGS should be launching campaigns for. Okay. So to lead us in that direction, um, I will hand the microphone over to Rebecca and just ask folks um, to mute their phones or mute their computers when they're not speaking. So Rebecca, it's to, up to you. Thank you so much, Bob. And it's wonderful to see some familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, thanks to the stalwarts who have been with us over the last five months exploring this uh, magnificent book and piece of scholarship. And for those of you who have joined more lately, I think this is a very exciting way to get involved. Um, as Bob alluded to, the uh, idea behind this session is to take the wonderful last chapter, which is a call to action, um, an exhortation, and translate that into um, both advocacy campaigns and potential programs uh, that CGS can take forward. Um, so it's my honor to introduce our um, inimitable guest speakers who have donated so much of their time amid their many other duties over the last months. Um, so I'll just introduce them in the order um, in which they appear on the book title. Um, Augusto Lopez Claros is the executive director and chair of the Global Governance Forum, an international economist with over 30, 30 years of experience in international organizations, including most recently at the World Bank. Um, he has taught at numerous institutions, uh, including the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and was previously director of the World Bank's Global Indicators Group. And um, I will say that I'm vastly abridging all of these bios, um, and so forgive me with um, our illustrious speakers today. Um, Arthur Dahl is the president of the International Environment Forum and a retired deputy assistant executive director of the United Nations Env Environment Program with 50 years international experience in environment and sustainability. And his most recent focus has been on global governance and UN reform. Maya Groff is an international lawyer based in The Hague and is convener of the Climate Governance Commission, which seeks to propose high impact global governance innovations adequate to meet the climate challenge. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Drea, who has the um, unenviable um, task of summarizing the over 500 pages of rich material um, and robust recommendations that we have been perusing over the last five months um, to give us a framework uh, and a starting place for our discussion today. Um, from there, we'll proceed with a, um, a recap of some, some uh, questions that have been pre-submitted. Everybody had the opportunity to send those in advance. And we have some, both I think from uh, folks who are in the room with us today, the proverbial room, and some who are not unable to make it. The session as always is being recorded for those who are unable to join us. Um, I was going to say that in person, but I guess synchronously would be the better way to put it. Um, and from there, we'll open it up as usual um, for an informal discussion and dialogue um, before wrapping things up and trying to take away some key points that can translate word into deed. So with that, over to Drea. 
Thank you so much. Um, so first I see some new faces and I highly recommend to not just read the book. Uh, so you can take a deep dive into everything, but you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch the previous five sessions uh, with the authors. And today's questions and comments are really centered on, as mentioned, this next step of taking action. Um, so I'm just going to very, very briefly highlight uh, key points in all of these sections that we've been going through. And then after each section, I'm going to ask all three authors if they could give us some take action components that we as civil society members can get involved with today. So looking at part one, the key points, uh, I think it's important to start with the UN Charter and the formation of the UN. And I will be quoting our authors throughout um, these key points. So the UN Charter is, and I quote from Maya, an extraordinary legal document that is now 75 years old. It's a visionary instrument, but the key architecture has not evolved to take us to the next steps forward. But all of our authors have pointed out, you know, there were some major flaws from the start. You know, it lacks uh, in the chart. We haven't had a charter review under Article 109 um, in, in this entire time of the UN. We lack global instruments to enforce resolutions at the gener General Assembly, Assembly level and especially when countries violate the UN Charter. However, we do have some model um, frameworks for building some supranational institutions, and, and this is through really the European Union. And I also want to repeat some of the timely summaries from Arthur, and I quote, you know, our problems are becoming more and more urgent, and we do know what needs to be done. The science is clear, but we keep running against the fundamental failure of our governments clinging to national sovereignty. So finally from Maya, you know, we have this fragmentation in the international system that is left undone. The ICJ has not been reformed since it was adopted in 1945. And it's not keeping pace with more modern legal tribunes. And already the ICC is already out of date. So the Security Council also has been this topic for reform. And we really need to shift a different paradigm towards a rule of law system that's based on contemporary legitimacy. So again, very, very brief key points uh, for this section. So I'd like to now ask the authors to step in and uh, to briefly make some take action components um, that we as civil society um, can really do these most urgent um, needs of reform that's men mentioned in this uh, chapter. And, and at any time, if I'm missing any key points, please be sure to add those and correct me. Arthur, would you like to start us off? Well, I think you know, behind the refusal to allow UN reform, we have you know, countries and many individuals clinging to a very selfish idea, you know, a sort of me first, you know, national sovereignty is the nation comes first and it's not looking at the common good of the whole. And while, while that was already difficult to justify 75 years ago in our, our globalized world of today, you know, the, the environment, the economy, so many things have become global and there's no global governance and that's why we're suffering so much. So it's a really, it's a basic lesson to communicate with everybody you know, how much the world has changed and how the, the whole idea of national sovereignty is, is really, it's a def defending a, a, the, the ego and it's ignoring the, the common good of all. We need to make a leap in values to, to go beyond that, that, that roadblock. Thank you. I see Augusto next on my screen and then, and then Maya. Um. As I read the the uh, two page document which you kindly shared with us, Drea, it seems to me that one important area of interest to all of you, your members, is how, as a civil society organization, you can engage on these issues in a, in a way that promotes some of this reform agenda. And here, I just wanted to make one one important, uh, it seems to me, a point. As I look at some of the more successful interventions from civil society organizations over the last 20 years in ways that were really um, 
tremendously important for helping us reform in some way our global governance architecture. I think of the campaign to ban landmines in the late 90s. I think of the establishment of the International uh, Criminal Court uh, a few years later. I think that the Paris Agreement on climate change in 2015, and then, and then perhaps more recently, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, none of these initiatives would have been possible without very, very heavy uh, involvement on the part of civil society. In fact, uh, one can even go further than that. One can say that it was really civil society organizations and you know coalitions of such organizations under the leadership of people like Jody Williams in the late 90s with the with the campaign to land mines that proved to be the determining catalyst. It would not have happened without civil society. It was only at a latter stage, once, for instance, the treaty, uh, the landmines treaty had actually been drafted. Um, by by civil society organizations that they approach um, friendly governments like Canada and others, and then it was taken up as an initiative of, 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 of states. And so it seems to me going forward, if, if we are going to have any success in uh, turning some of the proposals in the book into um, realities on the ground into reforms that actually make a difference and improve our global governance architecture. It has to start with organizations uh, such as such as yours. It is. It will not happen uh, as a result of government intervention or governments taking the initiative, for a variety of reasons. Some are practical, namely that governments are focused on a multiplicity of problems, which are day to day, which are urgent matters which the, the governments in, in office have to solve in the next six months, in the next 12 months, if they want to win the next election. The nature of political cycles goes against ambitious reforms of the type that are needed in the world today. So that, that, that automatically disqualifies uh, governments as a possible source of, of, of reforms. And of course, in some cases, they also have a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is. If you are Russia, um, a country that is now a pariah in the world, uh, that is engaged in a very unsuccessful attempt to take over Ukraine, that has an imploding economy and has large numbers of the brightest, brightest people leaving the country, um, there is no chance that you are going to want to reform the system in a way that might eventually lead uh, to you becoming what you are, a small middling power uh, who happens to have nuclear weapons. So for all these reasons, the initiative has to come from organizations such as yours. It is not going to happen otherwise. And the question is, you know, how do you work with others? How do you assemble coalitions of like-minded organizations across the broad range of issues that are, that are challenging for us in order to have the success that Jody Williams had in the 1990s, or that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons had in 2017. You might say, well, those were relatively minor reforms. They were not, they, they, they did not change the system in fundamental ways. But I think that they are examples of how we can work effectively. And as the condition of the world deteriorates further in coming years, uh, we might collectively end up uh, putting things on the table that are of a bigger scale than the things that are the examples that I mentioned. Sorry, I, I spoke a bit too long. No, thank you so much, Augusto. And then Maya, do you have any thoughts on this section here? Yeah, so you wanted general thoughts on, on maybe what campaigns to join with, what to take forward. I mean, there are quite a number of, of live campaigns that already have some momentum and, and some, um, you know, sound background that um, might be interesting to consider to join forces with. Just a few that I'll mention, you know, there's there's the We the People's campaign that Democracy Without Borders is, is working hard on, among others. 
to try to um, increase the democratic accountability of the UN system and with some you know, very interesting also near-term proposals, sort of a package of proposals. Uh, there's also the International Anti-Corruption Court uh, campaign. Uh, we are now drafting uh, the, the treaty for, for this court. We have uh, a number of official you know, statements of support from various governments, including you know, some G7 nations, uh, I would recommend highly uh, looking at sort of proposals in relation also to the this international anti-corruption court proposal, but looking at um, you know potentially advocating for an international rule of law package. I've written a few short, very accessible policy pieces on on that topic uh, because there's such high consensus on international rule of law, of law at the international national levels. Um, and this is such an important basic uh, piece of, you know, governance architecture to improve international legal institutions. Um, and there isn't enough work in that area. So it could be sort of an area that, need, that needs a lot of uh, sort of catalyzation, pushing uh, public awareness, talking to uh, different states to find the like-minded states. Then there's also the work that the Climate Governance Commission is doing on you know, what are the near-term levers that we can consider uh, to address the climate, planetary climate emergency and related ecological uh, crises. And John Blasto, who's on this call, is, is helping to put together a, um, a smart coalition, uh, meaning you know, uh, global civil society working with like-minded states. Um, and just some examples of, of what might be included there. Uh, we have some potential proposals for making the COPs more effective and then also perhaps can, suggesting convening an emergency platform for climate and planetary boundaries, uh, you know, overstepping these boundaries. And then the next generation architecture that we'll need um, to, to address the triple planetary crisis, including a global environment organization, which um, civil society, uh, but but mostly scientists and also heads of state have actually been calling for for years. Um, and there is there is an ongoing campaign for an international court for the environment, which hasn't gotten enough traction, which uh, needs support, for example. And and so so those are just some I think very very valuable initiatives and campaigns um, that need support and need to be taken to the next level. And just to, to mention, um, you know, uh, what was said earlier about, um, you know, how, how fundamental support of civil society is for many of these past successful campaigns. And Jody Williams has, um, she has a very nice list of sort of key qualities of a successful international civil society campaign for, you know, a new treaty. And I can share that with you. Um, I don't think I, I included it in the book, or maybe I did. <laughs> maybe it's one of the chapters. I can't remember now. But it's sort of like a recipe of how you build a good international campaign, you know, uh, sort of distilled down to about 12 bullet points, which I think are, are very, very helpful. Um, and, you know, part of the ingredients, it, the, the necessary ingredients is, is nation states states, governments that are um, conceptually values aligned um, and, and very small states can also be really um, sort of dramatic change makers and protagonists in the international system. For example, the Marshall Islands uh, in, in relation to the Paris Agreement in 2015, helping to catalyze uh, you know, a high ambition coalition of countries and ensuring that the 1.5 degree centigrade target was in the Paris Agreement, which we now know from scientists is absolutely vital if we want to try to avoid um, you know, catast more catastrophic risks. Um, and Liechtenstein just recently you know, helped to, to initiate the, the vote in the General Assembly and adoption of, of the, the, the step to hold the Security Council to further account to justify whenever a veto has been cast. So I'm just, you know, underlying this. And, and there's a lot of, you know, state candidates in the world that could 
be really valuable partners um, in these civil society uh, movements and efforts to move forward. Um, and, and just to you know, just briefly mention also a, a couple more ingredients in some of these very effective smart coalitions, having you know, visionary, bold, and effective diplomats, diplomatic professionals from various countries, legal professionals, both judges and lawyers, um, for example, with this advisory opinion at the International Court of Justice, World Youth for Climate Justice, they have wonderful lawyers who are advising them, even though you know the youth catalyzed it, and and they're 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 all working very very well together, also with governments. So you can see how much can that can be get done with civil society, with professionals, with legal experts, other experts, with with you know visionary and really active diplomats and and state governments, which also might use like their regional organization, like Pacific Island states. Etc. Um, to help catalyze buy-in around various proposals, so there are definitely some, you know, tricks and techniques of of the trade to to think about and and where where yeah steps really can be made across various areas. Thank you, Maya. And just you did include that um, box by Williams with the bullet points. Um, it is on page four sixty two. So. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, so moving on to you know these key points and the and the first half of part two, we're talking about this deep dive into reform proposals the authors are presenting of our central institutions of the United States. So again, after I get done with this, I'm going to ask the authors like, how can we? Because the UN is so bureaucratic. It's so hard to change. How can we as civil society really go in and push for these reforms that you are you are suggesting? Um, so the first one, obviously, the General Assembly needs a major overhaul. And chapter four is really this radical rethinking of it. And it proposes the proposal addresses the need to make the GA really the central institution with the UN with binding legislative powers. So it's this restructuring through this really staged approach both political and moral authority. And as Augusta pointed out, you know, we already have a precedence of this as the European Union for our model. And the second important point is, you know, this restructuring of the voting system, moving away from this one country, one vote, and instead, you know, moving towards a weighted voting, which is really well detailed in the book. Um, so therefore the Security Council then would become more of an executive system. Um, so with additional reform and restructuring, obviously all of us here, I think on this call, want the removal of the um, veto power. Um, we see how uh, catastrophic that is to, to world peace. Um, and, you know, again, with the proposal here, you know, every member country would have a seat at the table. So much looking at the structure of the World Bank and the IMF structure, and then really, as I said before, the Security Council becomes this executive council to shift this paradigm. So it follows contemporary standards of legitimacy. Uh, we really need to depoliticize the decision making and, it's, and make it more neutral based on values and principles. Obviously, the rule of law being central to that and, you know, more for the common good. Um, and also there's the World Parliamentary Assembly, the WPA proposal. I think Maya pointed out also that there's already, you know, led by democracy without borders. I'll put that specifically in the chats for anyone that wants to get involved in this campaign. Uh, but it's really to advise, you know, the General Assembly um, become really like a second chamber where we can move beyond the interest of national sovereignty. Um, and again, we have a model for this already in, in existence. It does work through the European Parliamentary Assembly. Um, and again, I'll put that chat, the link after I'm done here in the chat so everyone has access and can get involved in that way. Um, also, we really need an advisory mechanisms to support uh, global policy uh, making. So as Arthur stated, we have to pass relevant, uh, we have to pass relevant legislation. We need informed experts at front and center on various issues that we are facing. Um, so we need built-in mechanisms for experts from civil society uh, to be part of this process. 
And that's really critical to this next step in reforming the UN. And I want to quote again, Arthur, you know, we're still in silos, even though we know how to move forward. So we need to design this advisory process, which provides this foundation in both the GA and the executive level. Of course, there's a section in there for consideration um, for a proposal for United Nations Peace Force. Um, I, in the in the aspect of time, I'll you know refer to the book for that. But I I want to ask the authors if they could step in, um, and if they could make any um, uh, comments on you know how do we just as civil society, um, because the UN is so hard to access, how do we push for these reforms? I think we could go in the same order as before. You know, Arthur Augusto Maya. Um. Thank you, thank you, Drea, for for that um, that um, summary uh, of some of the ideas in the, in the book. Um, let me let me just share with you, you know, two or three three uh, points. Um, one pot potential um, place to begin, right? Um, that I think um, is not too onerous in the sense that it doesn't require uh, amending the UN Charter which is uh, itself you know a major challenge and, and on which there is a very interesting debate taking place today in the context of the summit of the future article 109 and so on which you already alluded to but one potential starting point is is, is the proposal in the book on the establishment of a world parliamentary assembly uh, because first of all this doesn't require uh, um, reforming the UN the UN Charter it's something that can be implemented by a simple uh, decision of the of the General Assembly under article 22 that article gives the General Assembly the 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 essentially the ability to to establish new organs as as needed the World Parliamentary Assembly as you yourself mentioned we have a very good historical historical parallel uh, the European Parliamentary Assembly eventually uh, evolved in time and became the European Parliament, a body that is very substantial and that passes law that is binding on its member countries. True, that took um, many decades, um, but you know you have to begin somewhere. The Europeans got it started in 1958, and by the late 70s, they went to popular vote, and they turned the Assembly into a, a full-fledged European Parliament. Um, this is uh, an initiative that has already gained the support of, for instance, the European Parliament itself. They have issued a resolution. Other supranational parliamentary bodies like the Pan-African Parliament and so on have already expressed their support for this idea. So for me, this is a, a potentially very fertile area where civil society organizations could, could um, uh, uh, carve out a role for themselves. In this context, let me mention something that we, we wrote about in the book. This is not a substitute for the World Parliamentary Assembly idea, but it's, it sort of highlights the role that, can, that civil society can play in pushing forward reforms. And this is something that happens once in the year 2000, the NGO Forum. Um, Secretary Annan, um, invited 1,500 organizations to participate over a two-week period in May of 2000 in consultations to talk exactly about the kinds of issues we're talking about today. You know, what do we need to do to mitigate the impact of climate change? What do we need to do to promote gender equality, to deal with issues of human rights? And, you know, the broad agenda that brings together uh, civil society organizations across the planet you know, focus on issues rather than, than national interests. And that engagement was very, very fruitful. Eventually, the, the, the uh, 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 representatives assembled, uh, put together a set of recommendations. They appointed one of their own, the representative of the Baha'i International Community, to take the recommendations to the heads of state summit in September. And that engagement took place. And the, the 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 idea that we put forward in the proposal in the book is why not make this a formal process you know rather than have an ngo forum once every thousand years uh, let's have it on a regular basis let's establish a mechanism where there is this this advisory role of of ngos you know to the to the 
bodies of the of the of the um, United Nations as a way of sort of sensitizing the ambassadors and, and the states, you know, to the great concern that civil society has about the lack of action on many of these fronts and about the importance of strengthening the democratic legitimacy um, of the of the of the UN system, which at the moment is is, is seriously lacking. Right? So for me, you know, this is this is one one area in which I think your organization, you know, toward working with others such as our own, you know, could could perhaps move the the debate uh, forward. Um, again, I emphasize states are not going to do it out of their own initiative. Uh, it is only through the force of uh, civil society uh, with the collaboration of well-meaning governments that we can push this agenda forward. Um, there are other areas that I, are potentially open, but, but perhaps we can come back to those. I, I'd like to say before the meeting is over today, a little bit about uh, funding the United Nations. And uh, let me, let, uh, and also a little bit about, about sort of breaking the taboo of reforming the UN Charter, which it has been for the last, you know, three quarters of a century. But I, I just want to make one comment on something that you said, Rhea, before, which is the sort of the one country, one vote, um, you know, system in the General Assembly, which I think has gone a, a long way towards undermining the credibility of the body. But it has had other implications which people are not aware of. And I just wanted to point, point one out to you, which to me is, is a very good example of the unintended consequences of establishing the United Nations on a principle which is very difficult to defend, one country, one vote, okay? And, and this, is, this is what has happened, okay? In the UN Charter, the body that has uh, jurisdiction, authority over the funding, the budget, is the Gen General Assembly, right? Without ambiguity. But <clears throat> just think, think a little bit, what happens in a body in which um, Granada, um, whose contribution to the UN budget is 0 0.001, okay? In other words, 1,000 of 1%, 1 okay, of the general budget, and Japan, which contributes 8,000 times more than Grenada, have, when it comes to budgetary, budgetary issues, equal vote, equal voice, right? Uh, it makes no sense, right? A country that is contributing 8% 8, 8 plus of the budget, Japan, you know, does not want to uh, have a voice on budgetary issues that equals that of Grenada or Dominique or, or, or Djibouti, all of which have one, one thousandth of 1% 1 contribution to the budget. So what happened as a result of this distortion, which I don't think anybody thought about when the UN was set up, is that the country, countries like Japan, the United Kingdom, the US, you know, the big contributors began to create a new kind of expenditure, which is called earmark voluntary contributions, right? Which are outside of the regular budget of the UN and which over time have completely dwarfed in size, you know, the size of the regular budget. The last time I looked at the data, I think I think we actually quote this number in the in the in the in the in the book the voluntary contributions which are which are done by a handful of countries four countries account for nearly 50 percent of all the voluntary contributions they are 11 times larger than the regular budget right so so you essentially have a small group of countries who don't want to compete with dominica and djibouti and and grenada on budgetary matters because they feel rightly we're contributing hundreds thousands times more than you small countries they have gone outside of the, of the General Assembly and they have created a mechanism for finding the United Nations, which fundamentally funds projects which are of their own liking, uh, representing their own particular interests and priorities, not those of the international community. So here you have a huge distortion in, 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 the, in the budget of the UN much of the the bulk of the resources are not under the control of the general secretary of the or the secretary general or the general assembly but these few few wealthy countries uh, 
which goes completely against the spirit and the letter of the of the UN Charter, right? So for me, this is a very good example of the kinds of consequences which people did not think about back in 1945 when the when the UN Charter was adopted. I could give you other examples, but I think that one illustrates, you know, in in, in a good way, you know, why you know the challenges that we face are really quite quite important, but we need to do something about them. And if I may interject, I may interject just, just any. any interest of time, we will move shortly to the, we will move shortly toward the interactive portion of the agenda. I think we'll be spending about five more minutes um, on recap um, led by Drea and I saw author, Arthur come off mute um, to contribute on this question in particular. Well, I don't want to take too much time now I think probably one of the critical issues in these reforms is that they must be designed to build some trust. You know, we have a major problem of lack of trust in governance in general, often justified because governments have not been very trustworthy, whether at the UN or at the national level. Uh, but I think in, in planning reforms, supporting them, they must be done and explained in ways to say, this will make it more trustworthy. We can have more confidence that there are the necessary checks and balances or the you know, you know, guardrails or whatever to, to build that sense of trust. Of course, part of that you mentioned briefly uh, is putting decisions founded on scientific advice, expert advice as far as possible, because science is more objective. You know, one cannot say that climate change is a political conspiracy by one country to take over another. Uh, and therefore, to the extent that that the, the foundation of decision-making is founded in, in the so social and natural sciences to the best possible, helps to build a certain sense of, of trust and confidence. Uh, one small comment beyond what Augusta said about the financing, all of this is because financing is a way in which nations can leverage power at the UN. If the UN was given independent sources of finance collected directly you know, at the global level, global taxes or other such such things, uh, that would that would already remove that that political manipulation and give the give the government give the UN the capacity to do much more of what's asked to do. Because very often it's, it's failure it's simply because the financing falls short, the contributions are not there. It simply can't deliver what it's expected to deliver. And then I think looking ahead in the very short term take advantage of the summit of the future coming up next year. The UN reform is on the agenda. And therefore, the more you can build public support for the issues being discussed there and pressure governments to be open to considering changes and adopting some radical, this is a real opportunity that hasn't been there for 75 years. So take advantage of it. Thank you. Andrea, should I add my comments? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so I think you you looked at the chapters up to the UN Peace Force chapter. Is that correct? So you just summarized That's briefly. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a comment on on you know the extraordinary steps forward, of course, uh, within the EU, um, which are extraordinary, and and you know we have a very short chapter trying to give you know a big picture overview, uh, very abbreviated, for an international audience maybe that isn't as familiar with. The EU and its evolution, um, but just to note that you know we have uh, the great luxury at the international level that we can indeed learn from what has been done at the EU as the most advanced supranational uh, region and um, uh, working uh, working regional alliance, quasi federation, um, uh, and and we can improve. Uh, on what has been that we can study, we can learn. Um, we can also, of course, look at other uh, federal, uh, more traditional, you know, nation state federal systems. Um, so, so just to note that, you know, there are many pathways and I think I don't see people doing that enough, um, looking at the EU, looking at different federal systems, comparing and contrasting um, and thinking then, okay, what are the different models at the international level? Um, and how could, you know, we have a, a EU, EU sort of approach, but, you know, more efficient, learn from, you know, the, the different challenges you know, under, under current EU treaties and, and, and practice. Um, in terms of the, I've just been noting the parliamentary kind of 
Assembly, World Parliamentary Assembly, except with the different terminologies in, in the chat. And um, there are many, again, there are many pathways uh, in that respect. And I think even having that a deeper dialogue on on the various configurations. Um, and I mean, I, I was listening to uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa recently, you know, a, a president for president of the General Assembly, and she was saying, you know, it's very important to retain uh, one state, one vote in some incarnation, or to, to, that is a strength of the General Assembly. Um, uh, and, and of course, in federal federal systems, you do have that balancing between the territorial subunits, big or small, retaining some you know uh, specific voice, um, regardless of their size. Um, so, I mean, these are very interesting questions to to discuss. But I think what we probably all agree on is that the democratic legitimacy, the legislative kind of um, facilities, including the advisory bodies, et cetera, which are grounded in in you know professional uh, advice, ethics, science, et cetera, are like vitally, vitally important important. And also, what I think is really interesting, which we didn't you know do. You know, in the interest of space, we didn't have have time to to go deeper in the book in terms of, you know, how can how can we at the international level also um, work with uh, and learn from dysfunctionalities at our national levels in terms of how democracies have 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 embedded you know various terrible dysfunctions, partisan politics, uh, money in politics, uh, capture, uh, lobbying dynamics, even when there's also strong lobbying regulation. Uh, it's just it's just such a, a terrible problem that is is really harming our democracies at the national level. How can we prevent such patterns at the international level? I mean, there's a whole kind of uh, set of questions which I think are really important uh, also to to dig into. And then just on our you know executive council rather than the security council proposal, you know, and peace force. These are you know these are really our thought experiment in in, in terms of. As, as was mentioned, the charter has been essentially frozen in time for over, you know, 75 years. Um, and these are just logical next steps. How do we improve the overall general governance legitimacy? So I think like in, in thinking of, we've talked to, we started to talk about like the concrete campaigns and different aspects of, of you know, reform, which, which could be, you know, really enhanced and lifted up and, and taken to the next level as campaigns. Um, but I think uh, like a, a broader issue, which is related to all these proposals, is the vision. What is our vision of uh, the UN as uh, you know the preeminent governance venue and and the preeminent treaty? And, uh, and and in that respect, I mean, you'll get to it in a moment. But the values and principles are really, really, really important. If we take those values and principles seriously that are already enshrined in the charter, enshrined in, in you know, widely ratified international instruments that are often near universal or, or universal, what, what is the vision that is inherent there? And then how do we realize that vision through our institutions in, in various ways? So I think um, you know, it's, it's like being involved in different campaigns, dialoguing on the different proposals strategically, thinking about design of, of uh, the various improvements, but then also having, uh, you know, the vision and then articulating it to different populations is, is, is really vital and also is sort of missing in the space in terms of this next generation international governance. Um, the vision around the values and principles is really uh, lacking. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, really lightning speed go through the rest of the, the key points as quickly as I can. Um, so really the next section is talking about you know, disarmament, the failure of the UN to implement and, and to mandate. You know, we have the mis uh, military industrial complex, which makes it very difficult to work around. We have these uneven steps forward, fragmentation of treaties, um, we have this reactive way of looking at things of weak governance, um, you know, and, and, and Maya has pointed out, you know, in our past sessions, disarmament is very closely linked to peaceful settlement of disputes, but there's this lack and political uh, will to really um, put a real effort into coordinate um, internet in, in an international plan on the UN Charter, um, especially in regards to Article 26. 
Uh, moving on to the rule of law and human rights, you know, we've had a lot of progress, starting with um, obviously the 1945 Human Rights Declaration, some treaties that were ratified based on that. We just still have a really long way to go um, at the international level and in reform, especially with the Human Rights Council. Um, and I think, uh, Arthur, you did, did a, just a fantastic job of talking about funding. I think it's really important, again, to mention human rights only receives 3% of funding at the UN level. Um, so we have all kinds of issues that we need to work on um, in order to advance that. Um, and I love that you talked about funding and finances um, to really move us forward. Um, uh, you know, we need to think about you know, more progressive tax reform, like taxing the rich. I loved the Tobin like tax um, section and, you know, independent source of funding like we have with the VAT, the VAT in the EU. Um, and then moving on to the specialized agencies, you know, we need more systems perspectives. Um, there's just too much of this silo. We need to, it's, it's this situation is just going to continue to get worse and worse unless we address this now and we and we take action on this. You know, we have inequality that is just, we're not going to meet the sustainable development goals. That is out of reach by 2030. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of solutions to that um, that are proposed in this book, you know, centering on progressing progressive tax systems. So taxing the rich, profit sharing, putting gender equality at the center, you know, instead of subsidizing energy, moving towards public health and education. Um, I'm not going to go through the IMF because, Augustos, you did that so well. Um, so I'll go to the environmental uh, crisis chapter and population. Um, and Arthur, you did mention that, you know, we need an in, in, environmental organization to really orchestrate this really complex parts of the UN system. Um, we need to bring existing frameworks in. Um, and, you know, with migration issues, with population issues, it's only going to get worse um, as sea levels rise. So, you know, expanding the UN um, to deal with these crises, um, strengthening mechanisms to manage that. Um, and then I really want to spend the last part kind of talking about the corruption, education and values. Uh, very, very briefly. Um, I loved the quote from Augusto and, you know, the last one that cor that corruption is such a great evil in the world and it causes a lot of damage. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, the establishment of the anti-corruption criminal court, um, as you know, and I love that you looked at the model of the ICC as you are developing this. Um, and then education and values, we do not talk enough about values-based education and uh, transformative education and how that's really key to global governance systems change. Um, I loved when Maya brought in talking about um, servant leadership should be woven in. Again, that's just something we don't talk about or hear. Um, and um, I love that that's being addressed. And I love that also, you know, in the book, we have such a foundation of these values, starting with the UN Charter, SDGs, all of our human rights conventions, the Paris Agreement, so forth. So we have this body to build this next generation. Um, so I'd love your thoughts on, you know, how we could actually take action on that. Um, and then again, these uh, last things of approach for reform. So always keeping in account the accountability, transparency, consultation for this common good. And, and of course, everything interwoven in the rule of law. And I will stop there uh, because I, I do want us to be able to spend some time on the questions. Um, so if there's any last thoughts to um, my summary, I'd love to hear from, from any of the authors. I think just just briefly, you know, with the 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 report of the the high level advisory body on on effective multilateralism, we have some other you know recent creative thinking. It hasn't made enough of a splash at the UN itself. Maybe it was released at the wrong time, but it has it has taken some of the ideas and and taken them further, and, and worth looking at. And in fact, we were surprised, you know, Maya commission myself and another colleague to prepare a, 
proposal for a global environment agency uh, for the Climate Governance Commission. And that report is cited in the High Level Advisory Board's report as the source of the recommendations on improving global environmental governance. So you know, these ideas are coming, might say, from civil society and are you know, being taken as reasonable and worth pushing forward by the, the UN itself. So I think these are, these are encouraging signs that maybe there'll be some breakthroughs on that. I'll post in the chat a link to the report that we prepared. Any other brief comments before we move to the questions? Just a, I can, just a brief comment, because I mean, we could say a lot on those chapters you summarized, but just in terms of, for example, the disarmament chapter, you know, um, in, in the current UN Charter, going going back again to like key principles in the U, UN Charter, which, which is our patrimony, <laughs> it's our shared international patrimony of every citizen in the world, you know, basically every state in the world is, is a party to the UN Charter. And, and Article 26 uh, gave homework to the UN Security Council to develop uh, basically a plan for disarmament in order to save resources, which should be devoted to uh, development, uh, social and economic flourishing and, and well-being. Um, and that homework simply was never done. So, you know, there's sort of these kind of a few of these kind of major hooks in the charter of, of you know, really bold visionary um, um, uh, provisions that, that the homework simply has not been done by the international community and, you know, often by the Security Council. So just in terms of, again, trying to go back to the roots of, uh, of you know, the values of our international life and, and the vision set out. And again, the Charter is a legally binding instrument on all those who have um, signed it. So just to say that, that there are, again, like these, these very um, major, bold, visionary, values-based provisions <laughs> that, that we can all uh, discuss, we can educate uh, uh, on these and, and, and take them forward. Um, and again, just reiterate, like the values uh, for international life and society are, are really there. It's a matter of the implementation and and I think there can be a really powerful discourse and campaigning around uh, some of these key provisions and principles. And I think we're going to move on to the pre-submitted questions now. Is that correct, Rebecca? Yes, and, and I'll try not to bias the pre-submitted questions at the expense of those who, who are with us um, uh, uh, synchronously today. Um, we already have some wonderful fodder in the in the chat that, that I will bring up. I'll try to tie these together as much as possible. And please feel free to raise your proverbial or literal hands. Um, uh, and we can get this uh, going with a little bit more of an interactive discussion. I would draw attention in the chat first and foremost. Um, uh, Helen and William have linked to uh, the agenda for the high level political forum, which convenes um, starting on Monday. Uh, well, the official session start on Monday. There have been some pre-sessions, uh, which Augusto also referenced in, in his comments. Um, our discussion today could not be more timely. This is the session at which the zero draft on the um, scale and scope and parameters of the Summit for the Future is anticipated to um, be taken. The decision is anticipated to be taken. Um, the EU has already issued their statement. We anticipate seeing more this coming week. Um, I would note that I think there was a question or comment in the chat, uh, maybe also from, from Helen and William, that um, are is similar to one that was pre-submitted about the role that civil society can play therein. And I would commend, and I'll put it in the chat, um, there are um, 11 policy papers of which, if I'm not mistaken, seven have been published um, to date on the various elements of the, the summit of the future. And civil society is invited to comment within the scope of these um, seven to be 11 uh, documents. And um, if others are interested in joining a project that CGS can be a part of in lending a, our, our feedback and our civil society society commentary, I think that would be a very cre concrete way that we can take this forward. I'm going to go over to a pre-submitted question. 
um, and t pick up on the issue of, of climate action. And um, Arthur is very helpfully linked to the proposal for um, a um, climate governance, uh, global environment agency. We also heard from Maya earlier the proposal for a climate court. There are also proposals for expanding the jurisdiction um, or even just the usage um, within the current jurisdiction of existing international criminal uh, courts, such as the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, to more effectively tackle climate. Um, last year, there was an independent panel that made recommendations on the jurisdiction of how um, a, a an explicit and standalone crime um, of, of climate, um, crimes against the climate, crimes against the environment could be included within the scope of the Rome Statute. And I'm gonna pick up on the question that was pre-submitted on how civil society can get involved collectively to take action on any or all of these proposals. Um, so I think I'll address that question first to Maya and Arthur within the scope of strengthening the international rule of law and climate. Arthur, do you want to you want go to first? Go, you can go first on this. You've been leading it recently. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, the Climate Governance Commission will release a report in um, probably November. We'll it will be a global online launch where you're, you will all be invited. Um, and we'll probably release a statement in advance of Climate Week and UNGA um, in earlier September. And uh, we're just still considering, you know, the final proposals in near term and longer term. And you mentioned quite a number of them. So I, I might not repeat, but I think there are some really interesting uh, proposals that, that we could all advocate for. And with respect to you know, building up a proper campaign and getting involved, I would defer to John Blasto to offer some, maybe some comments about, about the mega project. Oh, John, we can't hear you. Apologies, my mic wasn't on. Yeah, I was just writing an email, so I may not follow entirely fluently from what you said there, Maya. You caught me unawares with your introduction, but I mean, Maya, myself, Rebecca, Alan Ware, Amy Oda, we've been talking about this mega coalition for a long time. Um, CGS have uh, a lot of capacity in this space, a lot of experience. Alan Ware has a lot of experience uh, building coalitions. Uh, Maya is clearly the world authority on the reforms to global environment. She's shaking her head. The global environmental governance we need. So we have a very powerful team in a space that has incredible potential because it is so clear that this is something humanity needs to address urgently. It's so clear that even the politicians are beginning to understand it. So there'll be more uh, announcements coming up. We have a big meeting on Monday. One of the participants in this call, uh, that's who I was emailing just now, will be joining the call on Monday, uh, Youth from Africa. So very exciting project. You'll hear more about it. I'm not sure if I uh, address the point you were asking me to address by. I think I might just add that the, you know, because of both the urgency and the obviousness of climate change happening now, uh, and the science is so strong, you know, we feel this could be the, the most likely area for a breakthrough in global governance. It's, it's so obvious that the damage being done is going to affect everybody everywhere. Uh, and you know, they're, they're, we're so close to tipping points that there may be better leverage here to get even a narrow breakthrough and saying, we will, you know, we will accept global legislation to define those, that planetary boundary for climate change you know, and, that to, and to you know, equitably share the responsibility to stay within that boundary. Oh, we need a negotiating process to say who who should take what share of responsibility, including historic responsibility, including corporate responsibility. You know, it's, it's perhaps the area where the pressures are so great now, you have the best chance of making a breakthrough. So that would just be my addition to what's already been said. Thank you. Um, I'll just say how, how proud and excited CGS is to be part of the Mobilizing Earth Government Alliance, I think, Earth Governance Alliance. Um, not, I, I don't think it's make environment great. Uh, yes, John, what's 
the acronym? Make, 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 make Earth Great Again. Make Earth Great Again, yes. Mobilising um, Earth Continents Alliance. Mobilising, yes. Um, uh, and uh, picking up on uh, the um, global governance issues uh, that I think Arthur just gestured to, um, we had a couple of questions come in um, related to the excellent work that is being done by our friends over at the Stimson Center. And if um, anyone has not seen, I highly commend um, their recently published Global Governance Survey and Global Governance Index. We can link to those in the chat. The Global Governance Survey uh, takes stock of the opinions um, in both Global North and Global South countries, um, including BRICS countries um, and including EU and the United States um, on a number of issues, but I think what might stand out to this audience is the fact that more than half of the, more than 60% of the world's population consider themselves global citizens. And that, of course, is, I think, and basically the theme across all of the issues that Stimson looked at is that the, the popular opinion is far ahead of public leadership. Um, so coming back to your involvement, the author's involvement with Stimson, Center projects. Um, you lent, so I'm going to quote this directly. You lent to the authors your talents and prize money to the effort led by the Stimson Center for a UN summit in 2023. Yet last year, all the UN 75 proposals were rejected by the President of the General Assembly, except for one uh, favoring small island developing states. Now there is the talk of this at a summit, I think this is the summit for the future in 2024. And the question is, I guess, should or how should the NGO community organize again um, for these UN summits um, is not the problem, the lack of big state leadership. And so I think that can be addressed to any of our authors. Um, we haven't heard from Augusto in the, the context of the pre-submitted questions. So if you don't mind, maybe I could send it over to you first. Um, if I could just comment briefly on your on your question, um, Rebecca. Um, it seems to me that I see a kind of a, sequ a potential sequence of of events um, um, in the next in the next few years in the context of um, the recommendation of the high level advisory board. Um, to um, call for a, a review conference. Um, the first steps, it seems to me, beyond the, the high-level report of last April, is you know how can civil society contribute to ensure that the summit of the future actually within its program, you know, has a consideration of the potential for to call a, a charter review conference. Um, you know, one thing is for the high level advisory board to have recommended that this be so, and that in itself, I think is an important achievement because it opens up for the first time in many, many decades, you know, at least the possibility of considering uh, calling this conference. But, you know, how can we as civil society organizations ensure that in fact, an outcome of that uh, summit of the future is the call for a review conference. If we don't get that as a minimum, then I would say that it will have been a, a, a summit in vain in, in, in many ways. You know, I think that to me is, is the, the core minimum that we should be looking for. Whether that conference takes place in 2026 or a little bit later, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, the sooner the better because you know we are in critical time. I, I don't think climate change is going to be waiting for us. Uh, but you know, the, the governments uh, move slowly. Uh, you will need to develop some kind of you know so, uh, consensus among the states to to actually do that. But we can play a catalytic role, and and uh, we we can sort of contribute to that debate in 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 in, in many ways. Uh, because my sense is that states, many states, will resist the idea. Many states, you know, there's this argument which I, I find unfathomable. I don't, I, I don't have sympathy for it. I don't understand it. But there is a group of people who basically say that if you open the the possibility of reviewing of the charter, 
you might in the future end up with something worse than what we have now, which is not very much, right? And the reason I don't find that argument compelling is because the current system is not sustainable. We're going to crash at some point. And so to argue that we shouldn't uh, open the debate on what kind of a United Nations we want, because we might end up with a worse UN, is, is a, for me, is, is not a credible argument because the situation today is dire on multiple fronts. Um, Arthur has referred to climate change, but there are other, other potential sources of shock or to, to our system. The scientists are saying there will be another pandemic at some point. I believe that strongly because it is very much a function of the current growth imperative that we have in our economic system. There are vulnerabilities in the global financial system, which we don't talk very much about until they actually happen, right? As happened in 2008, 2009. Public level, public indebtedness levels are sky high at the moment. They're wartime. You go back to 1945, 46 to see the kind of public indebtedness that we have today. The fiscal space is hugely constrained. We have aging populations. In other words, you know, we have the unraveling of our nuclear order. It isn't just climate change. There are half a dozen, half a dozen very serious crises that are cooking up, and these things will interact with each other in, in multiple ways. Climate change and the global financial system are very much linked in multiple ways. And you know, the media doesn't focus on that, but 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 the people who have studied these issues understand that. And so for me, um as a minimum out of that summit we should we should uh, get a commitment a firm commitment to to um, uh, review the un charter uh, the sooner the better Thank you, Augusto. And I'm going to weave in one as Arthur, another question as Arthur takes the floor, which is how youth can be involved in this effort. Over to you, Arthur. Well, I think, you know, I very much appreciated the Global Governance Survey because it showed that public opinion is far ahead of our leaders. And therefore, I think it's a mistake to think that big state leadership is necessary. The big states are prisoners, either of autocratic leaders or of a powerful party or powerful lobbies, they're going to be the last ones to support this. I think we really need to be working through how can we draw together a coalition of many middle-sized and small countries who see the need for this, who are much more open to change and through their numerical power, you know, outweigh the resistance of the big powers. And I think building that kind of a coalition uh, among many, many, medium and small powers is a much more effective way of trying to achieve something at the summer of the future next year. Thank you. Maya, I see you coming off mute. Yeah, just in terms of um, the summit of the future, what I, I really see missing again is the, the vision from almost any uh, quarter really in terms of compelling narratives about what the international community should connect to compelling narrative connect to a vision connect to the these intersecting challenges linked with strong fleshed up fleshed out technical proposals um, I really see a huge need to build much more capacity in the system of states and experts working together to build up technical proposals for the next generation architecture we have or uh, that we need, um, you know, what we've been doing around the International Anti-Corruption Court proposal is, you know, we now have world-class legal experts, uh, judges, lawyers, former uh, high commissioners of human rights, et cetera, who are part of this process along with uh, national legal advisors, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, et cetera. Um, so um, my fear is that um, you know, the capacity is just simply not being built in a focused, you know, expert driven kind of way, which civil society can catalyze and, and help with. So the sum of the future, there's there, to me, there isn't really um, a strong vision coming from um, any quarters yet, uh, but we'll see if that changes. I mean, it's it's nice to see the Stimson work and, and the surveys uh, about the need for and then support for glo global governance innovation and, and transformation, but we really need to focus and crystallize narratives 
around also the concrete reforms that we want. What is our package uh, that we want to propose for the summer of the future? Because I think if it's just calling for a charter review conference without saying, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, these are these are some of the key, these are the key visionary directions of travel uh, we would like to see, then um, it's 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 a little bit empty and chaotic. And uh, then if there were a charter review conference, um, what is it, there needs to be preparation. There needs to be really, really strong technical preparation. So those are some of, of my uh, concerns. Um, and I've already mentioned some of you know, the key areas that I think the international community civil society should be working on international rule of law upgrades, planetary boundary governance, um, you know, the, the ecological measures that we're, we're looking at at the Climate Governance Commission, and then on UN Security Council reform, which is the HLAB you know, report mentioned that as, as a key issue for charter review. There has to, again, there has to be like a visionary, like a new paradigm of, of what our governance system should be like. Our apex body should be very strongly grounded on modern uh, standards of governance legitimacy. And again, I don't see that vision being you know, shouted from the rooftops uh, anywhere within the UN system at this moment. I'm going to pick up on a couple themes in the chat, and then I'm going to go to Tad, um, David Auden, and um, Carla in the order in which I saw their hands raised. Um, just to pick up on the themes that I'm seeing in the chat about US engagement on some of these issues. Um, Augusto referenced the multiplicity of challenges. I think a lot of the pre-submitted questions had to do with climate, um, but there are numerous others, the threat of a global pandemic, another global pandemic, um, and of course, um, the uh, uh, repercussions and and waves ripple effect that we're seeing from the crime of aggression being so um, explicitly committed. Um, and to reference an earlier point that was made in the chat um, by Helen and William about the special tribunal for the crime of aggression in Ukraine. I mean, this is kind of extraordinary in a lot of ways because this is it's under the auspices of Eurojust. It's funded by the ICC, the EU, and supported by the United States. And the prosecutors will be composed of um, prosecutors from um, the ICC ranks, from Ukrainian uh, domestic prosecutors, um, and from EU countries. Um, we've seen um, in both houses of the US Congress unanimous resolutions, some of the only unanimous resolutions in the last Congress and the current Congress dedicated to global cooperation on Ukraine. There is an issue of selectivity that it's only Ukraine at the moment, um, but I think we can engage in, in a, a more fruitful discussion about how that can be expanded. Um, so with that, um, oh, and with reference to um, congressional resolutions, not including the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, specifically the, the Global Fragility Act, um, I think in this current Congress, we've seen a couple of resolutions that have referenced the SDGs in a, a variety of ways from um, women's uh, political participation and rights um, to biodiversity, but we have yet to see them really in a sustain um, in a uh, robust reflected in a robust manner within the, the current congressional makeup. So I'm going to go over to Tad. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hello, uh, colleagues and comrades. Um, and our three uh, wonderful authors. I, um, I'm so glad that all three of our authors are talking about uh, an Article 109 Charter Review Conference, and I want to elaborate on that with three quick points. One, yes, it, it is clearly the, the premier hypothetical vehicle uh, by which we could invent a third generation world organization uh, and, and have a conversation about the question, what kind of UN would we create if we were designing it from scratch today? But that said, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Convincing governments to do that is, is, is a heavy lift, but we can start advocating it tomorrow. And that, that, this is my second point. I want to distinguish between an actual convening of a 109 conference and just us talking about it, because I think us talking about it is a tremendous activist vehicle because it conveys that it's not our idea. It's not just these 25 people. You know, when we're talking to people not on this Zoom out there in the world, we're not coming up with the idea of a conference to reinvent the United Nations. The framers of the charter itself said this charter is not an eternal charter. And my third and final point is this can be a tremendous vehicle for youth uh, mobilization 
because of the model UN scenario. Um, Rick Ponzio and Tad Daly three times in the 1990s organized with, with a lot of help from other people, organized not model UNs, but model UN charter review conferences, actually getting students to get together and say, well, it may not be happening in the real world tomorrow, but let's pretend that it's happening. Instead of simulating the UN today, let's simulate rewriting the United Nations Charter. I think that's something that can both generate a lot of zeal among young people and perhaps something we can really raise some money to support. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ted. I'm seeing applause from Maya, and I also am really delighted to note that the last point that you raised, um, um, Model UN Plus, uh, is an active program of CGSs that we do um, intend and hope um, and have great ambitions for future funding for. Um, David, over to you. A uh, comment and a question. Uh, first, a comment. When I saw the title of this book, Global Governance, I realized that's not necessarily the same as global government. But as I read the book then, I saw three different ways in which um, global uh, governance is described. First as reform, then as transform, then as replace. Um, I think the UN could be reformed, but still remain a confederation of national governments. A transformation, though, would transform it into a federation of national governments. And then if that doesn't work, then there's talk about replace. And that's where a global constitution might do an end around uh, to get a global government. Um, my question, then, is it's my understanding that all three authors are of the Baha'i faith. And I'm wondering how their faith, then, motivated them to do this kind of work. Wonderful question. Um, I'll go to Arthur. I see he came off mute. Well, I think you know the need for collective security, a federated you know world government system with a single currency, is part of our teachings from the 19th century. It's part of the foundation of the Baha'i vision of the oneness of humanity uh, being part of one single planetary system. So you might say it's inherent in the, our, the foundation of beliefs of our faith. So it's quite logical. That we would from our professional expect to say how can we take our core values and phrase them in terms of the needs of today to try to move towards that vision that we've had for more than 100 years thank you would maya or augusto like to comment on that and uh simon i see uh, your hand um as well as yaya um so adding you to the list after carla next um I don't want to repeat what Arthur has said. He has certainly spoken for, for me. Simply to add that <clears throat> everything that I have learned in, in the, over the last you know, three, four decades, working for international organizations like the, like the IMF, like the World Bank, like the World Economic Forum, has, in addition to whatever beliefs I may have as a member of the Baha'i community, Confirm to me that uh, in a world that is increasingly integrated, in a world where barriers are coming down um, across multiple multiple areas, from trade to finance to you know movement of people, um, especially you know looking at the experience over the last half a century of the European Union. I am convinced that the time will come when we will have to build up the institutional infrastructure that will support this process of political and economic integration. The Europeans are already doing that. And I think that this will happen. The Baha'i writings don't, don't speak on you know, how long this process will take. We could debate that. You know, it may be something that will will take a great deal of time, and you know, uh, one could make some pretty, cr very credible arguments. But my own conviction is that that process is gradually unfolding before us, has been already since the UN Charter was was adopted in 1945, and something that is likely to accelerate that process is the kind of crisis that we're currently facing which I think are leading more and more people to the, to the realization, the conviction 
that the current system is not sustainable. It is not working in our interests and we need to either reform it or evolve it into something much stronger. Just a couple of quick comments to, to supplement. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I would also echo that thought that, you know, practicing in international law and around very old, also international legal institutions that I've worked with, um, there, there is like a, a very beautiful visionary strain to international law and international uh, legal uh, institution building that, that has a variety of, of diverse religious and secular uh, philosophical sources, which are unbelievably inspiring. So um, the Baha'i Faith just echoes sort of, I think, those sources uh, for me, like reaching back into the history of international law, the Hague Peace Con first Hague Peace Conferences, and those early visionaries of international law are so in inspiring in, in their vision of, you know, a, a unified uh, humanity where where justice and peace really are are really reign <laughs> and are very much embodying in human society and. In the Baha'i writings, it, it talks about, you know, we're we're as as a human family. We're moving into, you know, our maturity. Finally, this is this is like a phase of stormy adolescence <laughs> for us, and and you can really see that kind of foment and uh, confusion all around us. Um, and then then looking at, you know, the UN documents, uh, visionary instruments, of course, reading the Charter, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. Just absolutely gorgeous, beautiful uh, values and concepts about the dignity of the human uh, person, about really essentially about our, our unity, which is based in religious, diverse religious sources and also secular and philosophical sources. So I think, you know, the Baha'i Faith really underlines um, the nobility of each human being, abolition of prejudices, equality of men and women. Um, that you know we can have unity and diversity. It's very much possible. It's it's our it's our birthright. Um, so it just echoes, I think, what we've already created uh, uh, in the UN and in these really magnificent legal documents that that we have already uh, uh, fashioned uh, together. Um, thank you for that. That's um, stirring. Um, and I think uh, inspirational calling. And, you know, as John says, we are not all Baha'i, but I think anybody who shares um, the hope and prospect of the goals of Democratic World Federation and of international law itself um, is like-minded. I'm going to do a lightning round going to Carla Yaya um, first, do both of those questions at one time. Then um, I will go to Simon, and it's speak now or forever hold your peace for anybody else who would like to raise their hand. So we'll go Carla, Yaya, uh, give space for our um, speakers to answer, then Simon, and if there is any other question from the room before a final question that was pre-submitted and some wrap-ups. Carla, over to you. Yes, thank you. I too want to thank our three authors for really being present today. And then this final round about being explicit about your faith. Um, I would like to ask the question, in light of the fact that the Parliament of World Religions is meeting this August in Chicago, which would mean eight to 10,000 people are gathering, is CGS present there? I can just answer that very quickly. Yes, um, our incoming president um, is going to be present, as I might be as well, and I'm sure many of our members will be. Um, so we can speak further about the nature of our engagement and participation in the Parliament of World Religions. But we have historically been very involved with that um, that event, um, and not just the event itself, but of course, all of the ongoing um, participation and um and community organizing that goes up to it. So yes, Carla, and would, I'll follow up with you on that one. So I'll take that away from our speakers. And Thank go to you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, uh, bravo, just go. Ayaya, over to you for your question. Yeah, um, I'll try to make this quick. So I'm Yaya. I'm in high school. Um, I go to a high school in New Jersey. And this summer, Jay has been really helpful to me with this research project that I've been doing. Um, and this 
project focuses a lot on international law and its jurisdiction. And along with that, I need to come up with an action plan that benefits my local community um, to engage more people with my topic. So I was just, um, I wanted to ask the authors if they had any recommendations for how anyone of any age could take action on a local scale. I live in a really small town and I'd love for more people to become more aware of certain issues. Thank you, Yaya, and noting that Yaya is one of that vanguard um, of CGS pilot youth that has been involved um, with the programming that I hope Drea will have an opportunity to reference at the end. Um, William, did I see your hand? I'm going to go to the speakers for their answers, but I couldn't quite tell. The Helen and William? No. Okay. So go to our speakers for their answers, then over to Simon. Perhaps in terms of local communities, uh, and I think probably the most important understanding that we can try to share is that we think it's perfectly normal that we have government in our local community, that there's some kind of a, a mayor, that there's decisions taken for the benefit of the community. We accept it perfectly normal that we have a national government and we imagining what, a, what our country would be like if we didn't have a government, we didn't have any kind of laws. It was just anarchy or so on and so forth. And a few countries are, are falling to that state today, unfortunately. So it's perfectly logical that in a globalized world, we need the same kind of institutions at the, at the global level. And to continue with this kind of anarchy at that level is creating all of these problems. I think the concept is simple enough that everybody could say that makes sense. We want to support movement in that direction. So I think if you can design your project to find ways of having that discussion, you know, at all levels, at all generations, about this is a perfectly normal step forward in the way our side grown, that would certainly be the kind of message you ought to share with all of your contemporaries. And thank you for being so involved in this. It's wonderful. And uh, as you're working on international rule of law, which is wonderful, yeah, yeah, I'm so happy to hear it. Um, I think in like you, every U.S. community um, across the United States, um, there has to be a reconnection with um, you know the history of, of uh, movements and philosophical thoughts and and policies uh, uh, for world peace through world law, which no less than five U.S. presidents. Uh, quite prominent presidents supported some version of world peace through through world law as as a principle that we should have strong international rule of law. Um, so reconnecting Americans with you know this this history of of American thought leadership in this respect, I think, is very very important because for whatever reason, you know, the military path seems to have been dominated, which is which is not. Um, it, it is not the whole story, and I would say is not the true roots of, of American leadership in the world. Also, the American involvement in uh, the, the UN Charter, drafting of, of the UN Charter, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course, with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so connecting, there, and there's other just tremendous international peace movements very early in, in across the, the, the United States, and I can, I can link you with with a scholar who um, has really dug up a lot of information on those early peace movements and very prominent peace movements in, in the US that I think are very interesting. And this is very grassroots you know, US uh, thinking and, and um, I think uh, Americans should really be connected with all this extraordinary history because I think that's it, when you talk to an average person, like, is it better to have a very expensive military and sort of have a dominance <laughs> system in the world, or is it better to have just proper rule of law? I think citizens uh, will generally be very sensible in saying, yeah, of course, rule of law is, is a much, much better system. I'm going to give Simon the last question, and then with largesse, we might go over by three to five minutes, if our speakers could kindly give their time, just for some wrap-up thoughts. Uh, Simon, over to you for the last question. Um, I've been impressed by the three authors of the Baha'i faith, and I've had the privilege of being invited to speak uh, in centers of Baha'i faith three times, once in the University of Maryland and twice in Los Angeles, where I live. Second point, the UN Charter. Um, because of the Security Council blocking everything, it is useless, in my view, to reform the UN Charter. 
because always the Security Council, starting with Stalin long time ago, who initiated this blockage, it'll be blocked again. So that's useless to try to reform the UN Charter. Third, the USA, where we live, is a federation. Look at us with a federation. Does it have a healthcare system that's equal for everybody free of charge, like the European Union has? Does it have have a university educational system that is free of charge that the European Union has? Of course not. We are a federation, but we have not really been federated enough. However, the answer comes from the European Union, as has been mentioned many times today, as before, that the European Union is a model that's working and that if we can extend the European Union to a world union and there are many unions that are waiting in africa and asia and other places to become part of this world union we could then have the kind of world we are seeking and dreaming about thank you it is very hard to follow that because i think that accurately summarized exactly why we exist um our raison d'etre um to bring this forward, I would commend to everybody the uh, current Citizens for Global Solutions website, which lays out our advocacy in five areas that are very intersectional. Some of the ideas and programs and proposals that you've heard today are referenced. I've noted a few that are not. Um, I think we could uh, do better in, in terms of including the International Anti-Corruption Court as a proposal for a new global institution and mechanism. I think um, we can extrapolate on some of the various modalities for climate justice that have been suggested here and that have been extensively researched and supported by our authors. Um, we also, in addition to these areas, have programming. Drea has very kindly uh, put kindly put into the chat um, the uh, uh, basic premise of our youth programming, which was brought up several times. And I think this could be expanded further in addition to our model UN plus. Um, I reference the universal periodic review that um, one of our um, our collaborators has worked on a uh, youth program for, and then the SDGs themselves were raised as an area of youth focus and active engagement. We are in ECOSOC status, which means that we actively engage in UN civil society consultations, and we are committed to bringing youth as well as our membership generally to the quote unquote room where it happens to engage in these discussions, as well as advocacy domestically on the Hill, um, given that we are headquartered, I'm coming to you from our office here in Washington, DC. So I hope we may take several of these strands forward, both in terms of advocacy um, and in terms of programming. Um, I also heard some interest in engaging more actively um, with the UN uh, Summit of the Future and uh, potentially offering um, civil society input on policy papers. What we hope in the next iteration, building on this and our advocacy summit that was held last week, is that not only through our website, but through engagement with all of us and your local uh, at HQ, but also at your local chapters. Um, and at the individual level, we'll have the opportunity to, if you endorse a proposal um, for a climate court or a climate uh, in, environmental governance agency, to, through our CGS mechanisms, send a letter to your congressperson or contribute to a statement, um, uh, a declaration for UN support, et cetera. Um, we would really welcome all of your thoughts on how to take the, these wonderful ideas that are put into this book um, off the page um, and into the lived world and thank our authors tremendously uh, for their generosity and sharing their time with us. I'd just like to, to ask, <laughs> thank you, thank you all for the applause. Um, and I'd just like to once again um, ask if anybody of our authors would like to, to close out um, what has been five months of fantastic engagement. Maybe um, I could just see who comes off mute first because we're over time. Um, 
I, I just wanted to thank you for the for hosting this uh, conversations and I feel that all of you are like brothers and sisters. We are working for the same purpose and quite aside from the substantive conversations that we have had, I very strongly feel that I have made 27 new friends. And that to me is what I will take away from this engagement over the last six months. I see Maya's off mute. Just a, a quick comment. Yes, also uh, a very uh, heartfelt thanks for these great discussions. And, and also um, to say that I agree very much with Tad's comment that having these discussions itself is, is a very uh, substantial and important you know, step forward. So I just applaud you. And uh, yes, thanks so much to everybody for the very intelligent, active engagement. It's, it's, it's been wonderful and, you know, and also these, these, these progressive steps can also happen anytime in, in a nonlinear way, in a surprising way. It doesn't have to happen even in the connection with the sum of the future and might not, that might not be the best uh, vehicle uh, for some of these bolder proposals, but the vision, the discussion, working out the technical proposal is so vital and fundamental. And I think we've taken some steps forward in these discussions, so thank you. Not seeing Arthur coming off mute, I think we'll conclude there. Arthur, unless you had a final comment. Wonderful. Thank you all for your time. Um, CGS colleagues, uh, Drea, Bob, um, Donna, if she's still on, if you want to remain on for, for a minute or two, we can stop the recording and have a little chat. Thank you all.